the reason why we have started this study and this is what we have ended up then start in a chronological form or in ascending form you try to start discussing table one table two figure one figure two figure three you know like in in an order indicate how the results relate to your expectations and to any given previous literature that has been cited previously and how this research have your research results have contributed to a broader scientific group this is also other possible problem that i always find in many art, many articles that you try your best to discuss your conclusions or your discussions or your results normally you should try to discuss or conclude based on your results but most often we fail to do this the reason is we try to discuss someone's results from other publications which basically deviates from what we want to give it back to the readers please try to discuss your results not any other results and always the editors as well as the reviewers would love to find a mistake in your article for when they review although the paper is written very good very nice this doesn't matter always they want to find some mistakes nevertheless you can disclose yourself a bit the limitations of your study although the study has shown results has been very conclusive and providing a factual evidence and so on and so forth nevertheless further studies are warranted because of low sample size maybe you can outline few other next steps that might be needed to uh, uh, to justify your findings you know this also gives uh, the readers a good feeling but also the reviewers a good feeling that you try to weigh your pros and cons and you try to weigh, weigh your strength weaknesses of the article by yourself so outline the next steps for your further study in in the discussion as well as in the conclusion references there are there are different guidelines for different journals um, so i would say avoid references that are difficult to find especially the links or the websites or the web articles please try to avoid such things sometimes you could also cite reports from uh, organizations such as world health organization or cdc or so um, the journals have different formats for reference style and this reference style has to be adapted to a specific journal sometimes we also realize that there are too many self citations because in references when we start to look into we start to cite our own articles as an editor or as a reviewer i would love to see an article with new references or recent references this gives the reviewer how quick or how good you might have screened or looked into literature for yourself the reviewer is doing a job to review an article he himself will go and find if something is published in this regard to your hypothesis or in regards even to your own country so if you find an article which is published in 2018 and 2017 which basically mimics or similar to your results when you have not cited such things or maybe you do not have access to the citations but still you have not cited this is a very major pitfall normally this is also other major problem that i see from articles from low and middle income countries that articles come mostly with references 10 years back dated not anything in the recent 5 or 6 years so try to include as many as and as good as recent citations in your article i will guide you through the next process called article submission select your journal carefully always before choosing a journal read the aims and scope of the journal think about your target audience be realistic of a chance being accepted in a journal i would not definitely go to a bigger journal like new england journal or lancet because i could self-evaluate the results for yourself 
to and be motivated to a journal where such things could fly. Always follow the guidelines and please, please make sure that it has to be submitted only one time to one journal. Your article has to be submitted only once, not multiple times to different journals because as editors, we have a big database or a cloud where we could see the articles, we even with different names, with different editors or different author names, we could easily find if this article has been submitted elsewhere. I will show you in a few minutes how this works. So the key determining factors are impact factor, reputation, access to the target audience, editorial standards, the speed of publication, the coverage in international coverage, there are other marginal factors such as track record, quality of color, illustration, service elements, and so on and so forth. These days you have so much of South African journal, Asian journal, African journal, tropical medicine, all different journals with an ISSN number, and you get bombarding emails from different editors who is sitting in China, but publishing from USA to submit an article and to get it published. Please avoid all these journals. Please consider publishing an article in a journal with a minimum impact factor of one. An impact factor of one is more good than impact with no impact factor or any impact factor less than one. Please increase your visibility by choosing right and appropriate journals. I will guide you through this process. This is a normal process like once you submit an article, you receive a confirmation of receipt. Then you have an initial decision by the editor. But nevertheless, I would like to emphasize here on the paper submission itself. Please make sure that you adapt to the guidelines of the journal like if it is 600 words abstract 600 words as a short communication 600 words 100 words in abstract means 100 words or less than 100 2500 words as overall article size means 2500 words three figures means three figures five tables means five tables or two figures or three tables or three figures or two tables means please strict stick with the guidelines because this helps you to avoid time lapse which means there is always a quality check which is initiated by a journal office and this quality check looks for many different components and you will submit an article today and you will get you will have to wait for three weeks and they will come back to you with a small problem they say oh well you have not included author contributions you have not included a section called funding you have not included a section called ethics clearance ethical clearance or your abstract is supposed to be 100 words, it has been 120 words. You are expected to put only maximum of two tables and three figures, you have put six in total. You know, things like this has to be avoided and could be avoided and you don't need to buy time. Basically, the whole process of the peer review takes at least six months from submission to be published online. If you may avoid all this technical and avoidable glitches, you may save time. So the quality check takes three weeks, then you receive a confirmation that it's been submitted. After submission, what happens? It's been assigned to an editor and the editor finds it, whether I should consider this to send it to review or should I reject it? Whether it fits with the scope of the journal or I could reject it. And the editor is sitting for three to four weeks because he is handling not one article, he is handling at least 10 to 20 articles per week. This does mean that editor is paid. No, the editors are not paid by the journal except for the handling editors. None of the associate editors, none of them are being paid because this is just a job as an editor is a kind of 
a, a honorary thing that you do for the scientific community because he has other things to do. So the editor, you should try to convince the editor whether he should try to send it for review or to reject it. The editor decides now, okay, I decide to send it out for review. Then we would try to find as good as and as many as reviewers in the context of research what you have published. Sometimes you may suggest few reviewers when you submit, but if you know these reviewers already, or if you have published these uh, articles along with these previous reviewers, we could easily find that as a conflict of interest in the database that such authors have proposed these reviewers and these reviewers have published already together before, which means we will not send the article to the reviewers what you have proposed. We assign the reviewers then and it will take reviewers is also not being paid. Everyone wants to get reviewed their article, but none of them is willing to review an article. So it is getting more and more and more difficult to get good reviewers. This means that the reviewer keeps this email at bay for three to four weeks. We send an automatic message to respond in 14 days, 21 days, 28 days. If the reviewer has not accepted the invitation for 28 days, we should assign another batch or a set of new reviewers. All right, so now the time limit from submission to sending it for reviewers took already one month or 45 days. And now the reviewer gets his own time to review the article. It depends on the editor how much time I should allocate to the reviewer to, to review the article. Some, I mean, most times we do it for 14 days, maximum of 28 days to one month. If the reviewer have not responded in this time frame, then we have to send an automatic message to advise the reviewers, please, it's due to submit your review comments. Please try to do it as good as possible and as quick as possible. Then again, you have to buy time. The reviews are completed. Okay, and then the editors will take another one week to handle all the review comments from different papers to, to see whether I should ask the author to revise the manuscript or I could say based on the reviews, I could reject the article and the notification is sent to the author based on that, either to revise or to reject. The revisions has to be carried out in a deadline of two months to three months, depends on journal to journal. And then you receive a revised draft from the author and it can be assigned again to the same reviewers at times these reviewers will decline to review it then this may go down to a new batch or a new set of reviewers which will invite few more trouble if you try to submit your article on time this helps because this may go to the same reviewer or if the editor himself feels the questions raised by the reviewers has been appropriately addressed, then I would not send it out to review, rather I would accept or I would send a notification to the author saying accept, nevertheless I will find some minor technical problems which could be still be addressed in, in, in the proofs. So finally it will be sent to the publisher after the acceptance, the revisions will be checked. The illustrations has to be given in a good format file like a JPEG or a TIFF file with a specific specifications with 300 DPI and so on and so forth. And this is all time, which is a minimum of six months. Unless until your article is rightly written, following the guidelines of the journal, you may have to buy more time or if you have not addressed or revised your article precisely and clearly what the editors have asked you to do so, you, your, your article will still be rejected. 
I would give you a best example in the next slide. Rejection, when you get a rejection, don't panic. <clears throat> Keep the deadline for submission of a revised manuscript. Return the revised manuscript to the editor with a point by point response to the reviewer comments. Read the proof sent to the editor and ensure that everything is right. Complete and return the copyright form. Wait, the wait for the article to available online. <clears throat> if the manuscript is rejected, please, 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 I request the authors to read the review comments of the, edi uh, of the editor as well as the reviewers. And please adhere or change what the reviewers have said before you resubmit this to another journal. Sometimes you see a rejection, you get rejected, although there is a review comments, you just surpass the review comments and you go for a new journal with the same draft in a different guide, guided format for a different journal. Please don't do this. And the reason why I say is, <clears throat> I will give you a very good example. <clears throat> this is an article which was submitted to Parasite and Vectors, application of microwave heat treatment in the DNA extraction of Plasmodium falciparum. This article came for review to me, and I have clearly mentioned in my review that this things has to be considered and these such aspects has to be adhered with a major revision. And the editor have rejected the article and it's been sent back to the authors. Now the authors come back again to an other journal, microwave based DNA extraction for Plasmodium falciparum submitted to the journal called Parasite Journal. This article is being reassigned to me from a different journal. And I know that it was me who reviewed this article. And I'm very much surprised to see <clears throat> if the authors have adhered to my review comments. This is what I expect to see. As the authors clearly say, that in conclusion, this is the first study using microwave heat treatment, which is simple and rapid promising alternative method to detect small amounts of plasmodium falciparum. As a reviewer and also as a researcher, I know that it was me who have published such a methodology in 2014. And this is why such an article was allowed to handle by me. And still the authors claim that this was the first study and I'm requesting the authors to cite the articles which has been previously published, even giving hints and providing the IDs. Nevertheless, I don't disclose who the reviewer is. Nevertheless, it comes back again with the same way in the same fashion coming back to the Parasite Journal. And I don't need to do much things. I just copy my review comments, what was given for the Parasite and Vectors, and I'm going to send this back to the same journal. <clears throat> The editor of the journal rejected the article again. Then the authors submit the same article again to a journal called Tropical Medicine. The same title, same thing, same story. Again, it comes to me for review. You see for three journals, how long it might have took. It took a minimum of four months for three journals, which means they have lost at least one year in publishing an article provided if they would have addressed the reviewer comments when they have looked into the, uh, the first review comment from the Parasite and Vectors. And this time I was really feeling pity for the reviewers, or, or sorry, for the authors. And I have clearly spoke to the editor and made my changes clearly as a reproducible method for extraction of Plasmodium falciparum. And I have edited the draft and send it back to the authors. And now this article is finally being published. <laughs> yeah, so this is what you, this is a very good example of what I could see. Although I never know who the author is. Well, Professor Vellevan. Yep. Yeah, your time is gradually winding down. Yep, I'm almost done, I'm almost done. Um, good. Yeah, I think this was my last slide. So just keep 
asking your question, does the abstract include a precise hypothesis and a take home message? How does the introduction relate to the study and complements the hypothesis? Are there methods sufficient to prove or disprove your hypothesis? Is it an appropriate and right statistic used? Is the study a valuable contribution to research? Try to address all these questions and all will be good. What I will show you in the next three minutes, I may need three to four minutes and then I'm done. So this is my last slide. This was my last slide. What I will show you quickly is, um, All right, so you, you see in this image that you see a lot of articles which I handled. For example, here you see, this is an article from Waldale Simon Volentalia, MD, PhD. It's accepted, maybe this may be of interest. So here what I see is uh, authenticate results, which means we can clearly see, um, we, can, we can clearly see um, how, how much of your article has a similarity with other articles, which means a plagiarism check can be done in this way. And more importantly, we can also see that this author has published. I think, yep. I think you, you need to, um put it in slideshow. Oh, really? Yep. I think I'm, uh, I cannot do it, or maybe I make it a bit bigger. All right, all right. Just go on then. So uh, I think that's what. Don't worry, just go on. I'm, each and every word of the draft which has been submitted goes through the plagiarism check and we can clearly see where this particular statement has been picked up or you have copy paste. Many of the copy paste can be seen directly when you submit an article. So this gives first impression is the article is well written or well copied. Then the second one is we can also see sometimes often that the authors publish the same study in two different journals in two different ways. We can also see the whole aspects of this author has published article with which different collaborators on which different topics. Yeah, so this all we can also find it out. For other example is so let's say this is um, this is a study for viral clearance after early corticosteroid treatment in patients with moderate and severe COVID-19. So I'm the editor for this. Now I have to find a uh, uh, a list of reviewers to send it out. So I just go to the reviewers. I have already assigned two of those reviewers. Nevertheless, I can start searching for reviewers with the title, with their names and the abstract. And I could clearly say, I would like to look at reviewers who have published one to 10 articles in the last 10 years on this particular field. So the database from Nature Scientific Reports is going to give me a list of 
potential reviewers who I can get in touch with or to assign these to them. And it's in the interest of the readers, sorry, it's in the interest of the reviewers whether they would like to take up this assignment or not. So this is an example. What you see is reviewer suggestions for this topic, these different individuals and so on and so forth. Hello, Professor Velivan, I think your, your screen has frozen or is not sharing again. I think that is the problem. The screen is not sharing. We can maybe you stop the screen sharing and start do it again. Okay. What what okay. do you what do you guys see now? Yeah, yeah. It's fine now. It's fine now. So the one what you see is the authenticate, right? Yeah. So this is the um, plagiarism check, what we see from where you have copy pasted things. And here it gives you the similarity index and so on and so forth. This is for the general uh, BMC, infectious diseases and medical genetics. And now I will share the other screen. So you see this now? Yeah. So this is for scientific reports. So I'm just trying to see for this title where I've been assigned to assign a reviewer. So I search a reviewer. So it gives me a list of reviewers who have published in this particular field with a clear uh, keywords that I could assign this reviewer. For example, what I do is let's say I say add to short list that's there. Please select good, that's fine. And then what I do is, you can also select reviewers based on the countries. Maybe if I want to have an expert review from Nigeria, then I can choose, okay, from Nigeria, I want to choose a list of reviewers. Anyway, it takes some time. All right, I think since we are since we are pushing around with the time, I will just leave it here and I will keep the next five minutes for uh, open questions. All right, Olu? All right, thank you very much um, uh, for that beautiful presentation. Um, very important. Yeah, that we've learned one or two things. For me, it's been nice that it's very important for you to read. You know, this is very important to read out, to read loud your articles to yourself. You know, because most of the time, because you are the one that wrote it, and it's very easy for you to get used to what you think you have written, which is exactly not what is there but because you have something in your head or it's not what you have put down or something like that. So it's important that you read aloud, you know, to yourself. Although I was expecting so many questions with a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, comments were made in the chat box. Everybody seems to want to, uh, they want the presentation. We'll see how that can be made available. But one thing that somebody asked, someone asked about graphical abstracts. So maybe I'll just ask you to explain this before you go. He said, he said, journals nowadays ask for graphical abstracts. But can you explain how to go about this? Uh, graphic, <clears throat> am I audible? Yep. A graphical abstract is just, uh, it could be a video file, it could be a picture, or a, a, a visual equivalent of a written abstract. So basically what you write in your abstract should reflect in this image so that the reader can quickly gain an overview of your article. Let's say it's a mechanism that you have found or a distribution. For example, you looked at the distribution of PFHR, P2 genes or some genes. Maybe you can put the Nigeria map and you can just put the distribution and so on and so forth. You know, like what you wish to say as a take home message can be reflected as an illustration. So this is how a graphical abstract works. 
Over. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, yeah, because of time, we don't, um, we, we don't want to give people opportunity to ask questions. That's why we said from the beginning, please just type in your question so that the presenter can, uh, can participate. I see someone saying he's raising up his hand. Please just send in as a text, a very short, short message. What do you, what, what questions do you want? And then that will be well, Okay, so if you have it, so that we can look at it. Uh, said, I would like to ask how credible is uh, Bell's list of uh, pediatric journal and publisher? That's a question for you. That's so relevant. May, may, may you repeat the question? How credible is the? Is the Bell's, this uh, Bell's list of pediatric journals? I'm, I'm having a break in your voice. Oh. Okay, let me, um, uh, let me see. Okay, now it's pretty good. Go ahead. How credible is the? Is the BL's, BL's list of predatory journals. I this uh, this BL's list, I always, I always see it also. I the have BL's list. What, what does the BL's list? Normally you have um, scholars list or you have uh, Thomson Reuters. You have this list? Yeah, actually, there is this guy that compiles, it, it compiles the list of pediatry journals over the years. Although it keeps, um, it keeps changing the list every time if he finds out that a particular journal that he has listed is not pediatry or it keeps updating it. But uh, I know that many scientists have faulted it. They have um, they've tried to challenge it. But I think to some extent, you, you have um, you have clearly said something that should guide, and that is make sure that the journal that you are picking has at least an impact factor. I think that's where to start from, and that's what the guy tried to use to compile the list. You know, look at people just like you said that sits in uh, in China, and uh, and uh, they send. I mean, their addresses in the U.S. And then you send in a paper today and the next tomorrow, you are given an acceptance you know, of it. So, I mean, you will never find a, a, um, a journal with some level of impact factor doing that because it takes a, lot, a, lo a long time before your journal will get a very small yeah, impact factor. Yeah. Okay. All right. If there are no more questions or comments. Okay, there's one question. There's one question here again before you go. Mm -hmm. Clarif clarification between similarities and plagiarism. When plagiarism check is done. So he wants to know the difference between similarities and plagiarism. And then another question says, uh, Prof said we should describe our type of data in the result, ages, sex distribution. But I think this is also important in results section. Will it be a repetition which we were asked to avoid? Um, I think he's saying the same thing because your results should be, I mean, your, your results. Okay, maybe you should talk about the first one, similarity and plagiarism. Similarity is different from plagiarism. A best example is the sun rises in the east. Can you change it? We can't. <laughs> Always you should say sun rises in the east. So this is similarity. The sun starts from the west and ends up in the east. You know, like plagiarism is something like you don't uh, cite or refer an author's statement on a specific topic. Rather, you just copy paste it. Plagiarism is just, you can copy it, but you have to readdress or restructure the sentence in your own way. And nevertheless, you can restructure the way in its own way, but provide the reference where this statement came from. This is called uh, a best practice to avoid plagiarism. Over. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let me see what I think. Um, maybe we can we can stop here, and yep. then if there are other questions that uh, yeah. Okay, what factors should be considered when an author is contemplating fragmenting data into two articles? I would say, why, why would you want to fragment the data? That's a question. Said, what do you consider if you want to fragment a data into two articles? So I was thinking, do you have to fragment your data? Okay. What, what is the need to fragment your data? Because this is the attitude of the author to have you can put all the data in one good journal rather than to splitting into two poor journals and uh, not, I mean, neither the reader is reading the cumulative data, what you have published, maybe he has stumbled upon only one of the article and he has never come across the other article. Maybe if you have put data together in one article and it goes to many eyes, this will be captured rather than splitting data into two different articles. And this is a kind of an attitude uh, where it, it deals with from personally uh, speaking. Yep, over. All right, so thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. I think we can, we can, call, it, we can call it a day from your end, but I'm sure you also want to see what the others want to present in a little time. So um, I'm grateful once again to you, my good friend, Professor Velevan for taking this time out to give us, and I'm sure more, uh, more questions will come. As the questions are coming to me, I will throw them to you so that maybe you can answer it and then I will throw it back to whoever. So once again, I want to thank you, you know, for this beautiful presentation. And um, yeah, look forward to your coming again to Nigeria and to Lautech and you know, expanding you know, our collaboration. Thank you once again. Thank you, Professor Olushola Ojorombe, Professor Oluinka, and all my colleagues and uh, participants from Lautech. I hope you have a very productive time amidst the COVID-19, which will superside or subside in the next few months based on my intuitions. But irrespective of all these happenings, we are all together to increase the critical mass needed for the African continent in terms of individual and independent capacities. I wish you all very good luck and we stay in touch. Thank you very much. I Thank you. All right. Right thank you very much. All right. Okay, so uh, I want to thank you all for staying with us. We we'll move straight to the next um, presenter which is going to be um, Dr. Gerald Ising. And so in doing that, I also want to um, uh, welcome uh, my co-host, my friend, that is uh, Professor Olinka. The director of uh, academic collaboration, you know, is also here, Dr. Uh, Gerald. So, Dr. Okay, thank you. Hello, am Hello. I audible? Am yeah, I yeah, audible? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Audible, please. Thank you. Uh, I welcome once again every one of us uh, to this webinar. I believe we've been finding it interesting. Uh, quickly, I want to just read the citation of Dr. Gerard Usin, who is going to present uh, the next talk now. So Dr. Gerard Usin is currently an associate professor and DRD lecturer at the Department of European Languages and Integration Studies at the University of Lagos. He holds a master's doctorate and postdoctorate degree uh, in the field of African linguistics from German universities of Hamburg and Leipzig. His research interest is focused on language, phyla, Afrosiatic, New Siaran, Nige, Congo, and Indo-European. He works synchronically and diachronically 
in the following linguistic areas, phonetics, phonology, tonology, morphology, syntax, less commonly taught languages, languages description, anthropological linguistic topology, less graphy. His publication include aspects of the morphology syntax interface in four Nigerian languages. Uh, defective double object, construction of LAM, the soup chain, Leo Spare, loan words, and Leo. Uh, from 1992 to 2006, Dr. Usin taught and conducted research at University of Hamburg and Leipzig and did field work in Nigeria. From 2006 to 2011, he served as a senior lecturer and dad lecturer at Makrere University, Kampala, Institute of Languages. Our subject was German in Uganda. And from 2013 to 2019, he was an associate professor and DRD lecturer at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. Uh, besides research and teaching in the field of African linguistic and German study, Dr. Wuzing is a specialist of higher education management, especially regarding tertiary education in Sub-Saharan Africa and relation between higher education institutions in Sub-Saharan Africa and Germany. As such, he worked as DRD resident representative in Uganda, as well as in Nigeria now, and the director of the DRD Information Center in, Euro in Ethiopia, and senior consultant at the DRD head office in Bonn, Germany, uh, between 2011, 2013, and part of 2019. So it's my pleasure to welcome, uh, to present the next talk, Dr. Gerard Usin, who will be giving us an insight into the scholarship opportunities that are available by the German government. You are welcome, Dr. Gerard. Yes, thank you very much. Let me share my screen with you. Just a moment. Yes. I hope the screen is visible for all of you. Not yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay, it's visible now. It's visible now. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I took the freedom to change the title a little bit. The title is now DAD and in brackets and other German funding for Nigerian students and academics. And the reason for it is that I'm representing the DAD and I cannot say so much about other German uh, funding organizations. When it comes to DAD, we have a very short and simple motto, which is scholarships for the best. And many famous artists, scientists, literary figures, and political representatives are of DAD. Just to mention the four whom you can see here, the late Professor Wangari Mathai from Kenya, who has been awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace in 2005, the former president of Peru, Dr. Michelle Bachelet, and her country, fellow countryman, the author Mario Vajas Losa, who has been awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature some time back, as well as the German astronaut, Dr. Alexander Gers, and there are very many which I could mention here, but I just want to give you a picture of four of them. Um, the next slide shows you some numbers from the year 2019. Um, in 2019, the DID was able to award around 145,000 scholarships and they were divided into two groups. Out of the 145,000, around 60,000 scholarships went to so-called so incoming scholarship holders. This is, uh, in other words, foreigners who come or who go to Germany or study somewhere else with a scholarship of the DAD. And the other group, which is a bit bigger, is the Germans 
who are outgoing into other countries, universities in other countries, and the number was around 85,000 in that year. And let's just have also a quick look at Sub-Saharan Africa. So I stands for incoming. The number is almost 7,000. That means around 7,000 scholarships have been awarded in 2019 for African scholars. And 2,380 scholarships have been awarded to Germans in order to come to African institutions of higher education. And the total number in that year for Africa was more than 9,000 scholarships. So it's quite a critical mass which we can offer uh, for scholars in Sub-Saharan Africa. The DAD as such, so that you have an idea of who we are, we are a self-governing organization of the German universities. Germany has around 400 universities and at the moment 242 of these universities are members of the DAD, as well as 104 student representative bodies. Uh, they form the, the whole association of the DAD. And the map which you can see on the right hand side is uh, a map with places where you can find German universities, German universities in Germany. Sorry, hello, hello Dr. Uthi. Yes. Can you, can you, sh I mean, can you um, do uh, a slideshow? I think it will be bigger if that is possible. Okay, you mean, you mean, uh, yes, like yeah. this one? Yep. Okay, good. As I said before, we are an association of the German universities and the German universities, they pay a membership fee to DAD um, every year, but the membership fee is very little. So without that money, we wouldn't be able to do much. We rely on other sources. We get our funding mainly from the German government, from different uh, uh, ministries. Most of all, the Federal Foreign Office of Germany, which contributed 35% uh, of our budget in 2019. Also the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, the Ministry for Economic Cooperation Development, and last but not least, the European Union. Uh, uh, sorry, Union. These are our main sponsors. Uh, they give DAD the money which we transform into scholarships. And all in all, in the year 2019, we were able to spend 594 million euro for scholarships and grants. The DAD is in existence since 1925 and in the course of time we developed a global network which is displayed here and on this map. I just want to have us to have a look at Sub-Saharan Africa. We have our main office in Nairobi for Sub-Saharan Africa. We have three so-called information centers, in, uh, one in Accra, one in Yaoundé, one in Johannesburg, and there used to be one in Addis Ababa, which has now been transformed uh, into a so-called information point, which is a smaller and smaller office. And on top of this, we have at the moment uh, 23 so-called DAD lecturers in Sub-Saharan Africa, and I'm one of them stationed here in Nigeria. There's a second one also stationed in Nigeria at the University of Ibadan. Um, and as a DAD lecturer, we are, as the title says, we are lecturing at universities, but at the same time, we also take care of the DAD business. We give information, uh, we uh, advise people how to um, receive scholarships and so on and so forth. So I saw Participants in this webinar, they're not only from Nigeria. I saw some, some two, I think, from Malawi and one at least from, uh, from Cameroon. So for those ones who are not joining now from Nigeria, please, I would advise you, if you have questions concerning scholarships and DAD, please contact your nearest contact point, not uh, me or my colleague in Nigeria, because the, the whole framework and the rules may differ from the Nigerian context to your context. Um, so please check the DAD website and find out where the nearest DAD person in your country is. And in case of questions, get in contact with that person. 
Now let's talk about Nigeria. What are our aims in Nigeria? It is to, to advance academic exchange and establish networks to provide information and counseling, to promote German higher education, to fund organizational and limited financial support to Nigerian universities. And last but not least, to award scholarships for individuals and funding for university cooperations. This slide gives you an overview on the development of scholarship holders in the Nigerian German context, starting from 2010. And it shows that at least from 2015, the numbers are growing constantly. In the last year, we had a total number of 520 scholarship holders in the Nigerian German context, 467 Nigerians and 53 um, Germans. The numbers for Nigeria could be even higher. Um, let me compare the number, these numbers, for example, with the numbers which we used to have in, in Ethiopia. And Ethiopia is a country only half of the size of Nigeria, half of the population of Nigeria, half of the number of universities. But uh, in 2019, they had the double number of scholarship holders. And the simple reason is that we received very many more applications from, from Ethiopians than from Nigerians. So I would really encourage everybody who is eligible and who is qualified to try and to apply for a scholarship from DAD because we can still increase the numbers for Nigeria and the chances are not so bad to be one of the lucky ones. Now in the next part, I will introduce to you some um, explicit scholarship programs. I cannot introduce all of them because they are just too many, but the, the most relevant ones I would, I would like to introduce to you in brief. DAD does not only offer scholarships to study or do research in Germany, but also in, uh, when it comes to the African context, in your home country or in other countries of the region. Now, in the case of Nigeria at the moment, we don't have any in-country program uh, scholarships. So we don't at the moment have scholarships to study to a master course or do your PhD or, or PhD is not true. But when it comes to master, we don't have scholarships to do a master uh, with a scholarship in Nigeria. But we have scholarships also for Nigerians to study and do a master at other African universities. That's our in-region scholarship program. Who can apply? The target group are graduates and postgraduates from any sub-Saharan African country. You must have a first academic degree if you want to apply for a master program, or you must also have a master degree if you want to do, uh, uh, if you want to join a, um, a doctorate program. We um, especially encourage female applicants and candidates from less privileged regions or groups to participate in the program and to file their applications. We don't have quota for female candidates. We don't have regions, but we take those applications in special considerations. What is supported? These are individual scholarships for selected master and PhD courses at universities in Africa. This is important to note. So there is no free choice. You cannot just choose any uh, master course and uh, apply for a scholarship with DAD. No, it's the DAD who has selected, which has selected you know, uh, courses uh, for which we offer these scholarships. And I will in a minute show you the number of the courses which we offer in the African context. And the duration of funding, of course, depends on the course program. So two years, up to two years for a master and normally up to three years for a PhD program. Now let's have a look at the courses and the fields which are available. I start with West and Central Africa. Uh, in Benin, we have scholarships for the University of Abumey in the field of mathematics, both master and PhD, as well as uh, at the International Chair for Mathematical Physics and Application in the field of natural sciences, also master and PhD scholarships. There are scholarships available for Burkina Faso in the field of engineering, both master and PhD. In Ghana, we are offering scholarships 
for Master Phil and Master of Science in the field of medicine and public health at the University for Development Studies, as well as uh, at the University of Ghana in the subjects of humanities, political science, and at the West African Center for Crop Improvement, also in Ghana in the field of agricultural science, both of for my scholarships for master and PhD. And in the region of West and Central Africa, we are also supporting a network, the CERAS network down there, uh, in the subject field of agricultural sciences, both master and PhD um, scholarships. But you as Nigerian scholars, you can also apply, of course, for scholarships for other regions. Let's have a look at Eastern Africa. I start with Ethiopia. At Addis Ababa University, we have uh, we offer scholarships for the PhD program, Global and Area Studies. At Hawassa University, we offer scholarships for the subject agroforestry. And uh, we used in, in Ethiopia, we also used to have scholarships for a program in railway engineering at Addis Ababa University, but that one was terminated. But I remember when I that was the time when I was working in, uh, Niger in Ethiopia. And we had also two, at my time, two scholarship holders from Nigeria who studied railway engineering at Addis Ababa University with a scholarship from DAD. When it comes to Kenya, as you can see, there's a wide variety, variety of uh, courses which we support with scholarships. Um, let me maybe just mention the fields. It's information technology, mechanical engineering at Jomo Kenyatta University. It's health management through the Kenya Medical Research Institute, but the course as such is taught at Strathmore University, one of the first class private universities in Kenya. At Kenyatta University, we offer scholarships, uh, PhD course scholarships for biotechnology, environmental planning, renewable energy, the last one only master scholarships. At Moore University, uh, we offer scholarships uh, as well as at Mount Kenya University in the field of surgical nursing and public health. And the before mentioned, aforementioned Strath, uh, Strathmore University is also with in our program here we offer scholarships in the field of mathematics both master and phd sorry oh what happened now i have to go back to the last slide yes that was kenya eastern africa continues there are also scholarships available for uh, family medicine in sudan in tanzania we have uh, two universities or centers which we support. One is Azi University in the field of uh, build and environment analysis, housing and settlement studies, urban planning and management. And at the Tanzanian German Center for East African Legal Studies, we offer scholarships for law, although the last firm may be not so much of interest for Nigerians. In Uganda, we cooperate with two universities and we offer scholarships uh, in the field of public health uh, at Ositima University and environmental and natural resource, as well as plant breeding at Macau University. And also two networks are part of our Eastern Africa parcel, the African Economic Research Consortium in the field of agricultural economics and the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology, ICIPE, in the field of insect science. And also in Southern Africa, you could be uh, applying for DAD scholarship as Nigerians to study there in Malawi in the field of aquaculture and fishery science or environmental health in Namibia in the field of biodiversity management and in South Africa in the fields of molecular biology and human genetics and as well as mathematics or in the field of migration and displacement studies. So these are quite a number of courses and to round up our in-country and region scholarship program, um, I would also like to mention this kind of program or it's a more or less a network. It's called Strengthening Capacities for Land Governance in Africa, SLGA. This is part of our in-country and region scholarship program 
We do this together in close co uh, collaboration with the GIZ, um, the German um, Development co Cooperation Program. They have a program strengthening advisory capacities for land governance in Africa. And, and the other partner is NELGA, the Network of Excellence for Land Governance in Africa. And this NELGA is actually associated to the African Union and also financed by the African Union. So and within this SLGA program, we also offer scholarships um, in Ghana, um, in the field of land governance and policy or geomatic engineering and in Tanzania in the field of urban and regional planning as well as state urban planning and geomatics. So this was a short overview on our in-country and region scholarship program. I'm coming now to the next program, which has the name Nigerian German Postgraduate Training Program. This program is in existence since 2017. It's a cooperation between DAD and PTDF, the Nigerian Petroleum Technology Development Fund. And every year, uh, PTDF and DAD, we are able to offer scholarship for master programs, 30 scholarships per year, and for PhD, 20 scholarships per year, for Nigerian students to study or do research in Germany. And within this special program, there are no courses which we have pre-selected. You can study any course at the German university which is related to the subject areas of the oil and gas sector. The application process has two steps. The first step is you have to apply to PTDF. They make a pre-selection and the final selection is then done by the DAD. We, we had problems in the last years uh, with this program because we didn't have enough applications. Unfortunately, it was only last year, 2019, that finally we got enough applications to give out all of the scholarships. So this might be also a good idea for, of course, for those ones who are studying something connected to oil and to the oil and gas sector. The next program, the third program, we call it EPOS, E-P-O-S. It stands for Development Related Postgraduate Courses. Now, these are mainly master courses at German universities, uh, but also some few PhD courses. And um, it is open for graduates from all disciplines with at least two years professional experience. So after your university degree, you must have worked for at least two years to be eligible for this program, to, to be eligible to apply within this program. What is supported? These are individual scholarships exclusively for postgraduate courses in Germany that are listed on the list of all postgraduate courses with application deadlines under the uh, web address which I have typed here. There are very many, so I, I cannot give you all the details, but if you have a look at this list, you will find all of the courses which we offer um, and for which we offer scholarship scholarships. Duration of funding depends again on the course. Normally it's between 12 and 36 months, depending on the study program. As I said before, I will not introduce now all the courses. I will just give you an overview on the subjects which are covered. Um, this is economic sciences, business administration, political economics. Next one, development cooperation. Also the field of engineering and related sciences is covered as well as mathematics and regional planning, agriculture and forest sciences, environmental sciences, medicine and public health social and political sciences and education and law and last but not least there's also one course a master course in media studies um, for which we offer scholarships and 90 percent of these courses they use english as medium of instruction and not german so in other words it's uh, you don't have to speak german to uh, join these courses to do these courses English is fine enough, but
But anyway, whoever gets a scholarship from, from DAD to go to Germany, it's always 